say, here's, here's the page. They'd hold up a piece of paper and they'd say, on one side of the piece of paper you've got pain and on the other side of the piece of paper you've got joy. <laughs> Good evening, Australia. I'm Michael Kazilny. Tough times never last, but tough people do. And um, welcome back. Um, love and best wishes. We've all been going through a, a challenging time over the last uh, two years. Uh, you probably saw that we've done a lot of um, interviews uh, online via Skype. I'm not very good at that, but uh, whatever you go through, just go through it. Um, this is one of our first uh, live interviews, and I've got a, uh, one of Australia's um, uh, most highly respected uh, psychiatrists. His name is uh, Dr. John Weber, and he's written this amazing book called The Red Chair. And what I like about uh, uh, John Weber is that he thinks outside the square. Thanks for coming on, uh, it's sir. My absolute pleasure, Michael. Thanks for having me. And, you know, uh, you've been practising for over 30 years and yeah. uh, Melbourne University and uh, a lot of um, the young uh, people in your profession say so you're a great mentor. But you now write about something that could, um, you know, attract a lot of um, talk but it's authentic. You think outside the square, and um, and traditional psychiatry. But, but you say, uh, you, with some patients, you talk you uh, talk about past life regression. Yeah, yeah. No, I I have to say, I was I was as you say, just very traditional in yes. my original approach, and um, and always attached to my traditional science and psychiatry. Um, and to be honest, even now, I still, the majority of my patients are of still course. broadly um, looked after in the traditional way, therapy and medications if required, and even ECT. If John, how many so. years have you been? So I, I, I started psychiatry in 80, would have been 82, uh, and then you trained for five years yeah. and then became a psychiatrist. In what made you want to do it? Because for some of the younger people watching, did yeah, you want to be no, a it's doctor? Because to start with, my first couple of years, it was I did surgical rotations. So I was, I was curious about that. Um, but then I, I happened to have, and I, the universe is a funny thing, I happened to get a rotation in psychiatry. Um, I'd liked it as a student, um, and I got a rotation at the Royal Melbourne where I was working um, in psychiatry, and I loved it. I loved talking to people. I loved the engagement with people. The, the surgical rotations I was doing left me a bit flat. It's like I didn't get to talk to my patients. You just sat in the theatre all day, mm. and um, it was a brief contact. So, so in the end, it, it just it was almost inevitable. It felt like that. And, Can I ask um, you something, John? I, as a criminal defence lawyer, um, you know, for the last two years, listening to all the stories and uh, trying to help, sometimes um, uh, professionals get a bit depleted. We um, it, we get emotionally depleted, and yeah. and uh, you know, all those years of listening to the stories, you've seen the highs, you've seen the lows. You've helped many, some you couldn't help. Um, were there times in your life when you sort of just thought you needed a break? Look, there you do. You you you're at risk, I think, in in a job like that um, of getting burnout because you you see a lot of really unwell patients, and um, you know, and in the early days you have an energy, you have a you kind of mm. you know, um, and you you hang in there. I mm. think there's almost a naivety when you're younger, mm. and I probably write a bit about that that in the book, some of those early early days. But it's um, Yes, you're right. In the end, you've got to be careful that you don't overcook it. Um, and and yeah. that's right. And, and and just briefly, how did what did you, what strategy did you use to sort of protect the, your mental? Look, health? in the end, the main the main thing really is to limit how long you work for. I used to work too long. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an addiction. I yes. think for for a lot of men, but now women as well, is getting too attached to their careers and their jobs. Um, but the main thing is to uh, is to set limits on the on the hours that you work. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, if you can, find things that you love, things mm. that you enjoy, whether it's whether it's going for a swim, whether it's um, you know playing golf or, or going to the movies. Indeed, you know, so. John, it's it's the festive season around Australia where mm. uh, a lot of us are out of a lockdown and uh, a lot of smiling faces, but still a lot of um, uh, angst, anxiety, uncertainty. Um, people are still. Um, I mean, we didn't just come out of this lockdown and we're all happy. It appears no. that way, but there's still. A lot of sad faces. Yeah, no, um, it's been it's been a real mixture, Michael. Yeah. I've I've seen people who who paradoxically have been quite happy with lockdown because they're naturally introverted, naturally shy. Yeah. Um, so they've been quite happy to sort of um, shut themselves away and not have the the responsibilities. Um, 
But I've also, I've seen every measure of anxiety. People that are frantic about getting the illness uh, and getting sick or their family or their mother or father. Uh, and then people who are furious at the lockdown, who feel their their rights have been have been restricted, mm. or, you know, get very angry at a political level. So I've, I've seen the full range. And then the ones that are very um, frustrated by the idea of, of having to have a vaccination. Mm. Um, so it's a it's a real mix. So, so yeah. if people are overwhelmed, but they're not at a stage where they need to see a professional like you, what's, a, what's some a quick advice how they can ease that, uh, that I th- tension? I think the, the main thing is to say, look, this too will pass. The, you know, I mean, there yeah, there are people that are unlucky who get sick, mm. um, and they are. And um, but I think sometimes it's just try and move your yeah your thinking into a slightly more positive. You can't always get straight to the happy. I've had patients who go, "Don't give me that positive psychology; you'll drive me crazy." You yeah, know, piss off. Um, but sometimes it's just if you can just get them to think a little bit more positively. Look at things. You know, the the Buddhist would say, "Here's here's the page." They hold up a piece of paper and they'd say on one side of the piece of paper you've got pain and on the other side of the piece of paper you've got joy they're on the same piece of paper you can't separate them and that's kind of lovely so what you've got is the choice of which side you look at so the, the i think the challenge is always to be to be looking at the positive side where you can and that's some great advice uh, of you isn't it when you simplify it all ten thousand joys ten thousand sorrows and um and gratitude works very well, for me, and so does meditation. But uh, no, that's so important, isn't it? Just to, um, um, yeah, just to um, uh, try not to find the think. Little, find the little positives. Find, find the little the, positives. See if you can switch your mind off. Yeah. Off the because we ruminate on things. We, we do. do. And we invariably, and I, I write about this in the book, because the thing about the spiritual approach is that it gets you thinking that, that we're I've all... never met many people like you, but after the break, we might talk about how you came up with that spiritual approach and now okay. you incorporate a practice. But uh, tough times never last. We'll be back very shortly and thank you for joining us. Welcome back to the show, Tough Times Never Last. Uh, Dr. John Webber, great psychiatrist. Um, um, yeah, near-death experiences. And you're incorporating, um, how are you sort of incorporating the past life regressions into current practice? Yeah, look, it's probably um, it's probably helpful to look at what made the change for me in the first instance because I'd always been very traditional, always mm. doing you know standard stuff um, as a psychiatrist. Um, but I, I, I then, probably about 12, 13 years ago, read a book called Many Lives, Many Masters by, mm-hmm. by a, a psychiatrist, Brian Weiss, who, um, and it was, it, my daughter gave it to me. It was a fluke because I don't normally have time to read too much. And, um, but I ended up having time and I, I read this whole book and I could not put it down. You know, it was a patient who went into a past life accidentally when he was doing hypnosis and, uh, and he was shocked by that, but it was, in the end, he couldn't ignore it. And reading his book and, and all the details of that, I couldn't ignore it either. It was quite profound. And then I had my brother-in-law come to me around the same time, and uh, my nice son-in-law, I should say, and his brother had, had died from a brain tumour recently. So his mother talked him into going and seeing a medium, and so he went off and saw this medium and did it anonymously, so she didn't know who he was or where, and, uh, and the medium ended up talking as if she was talking to the brother who deceased. Um, and but she came out with details uh, about the brother she could not possibly have known you know about a car that he'd given uh, my son-in-law and and his nickname when he was younger there were just things that were you just couldn't explain it in normal scientific terms so then I, I read up more about reincarnation and which is not in the end if you think about it half the world's population believe in reincarnation you know the Buddhists and the, mm. and the Hindu so it's not at one level it's not that big a deal but um, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of research related to it and there's a chap called Ian Stevenson who was a psychiatrist a child psychiatrist in America who researched 
thousands of, of children that were talking about their past lives. And in a, in, a, in a couple of hundred cases, he was actually able to verify the details of the life that they talked about. So I read about that. I read about near-death experiences, about um, uh, mediums and other psychic phenomenon. And in the end, Michael, I just couldn't, um, I couldn't ignore it. It was, um, it was really fantastic. I mean, my interest obviously is the hypnosis and the past life regressions, but all of it in the end kind of took me over. And I thought- So how do you incorporate that now into, um, in, into seeing patients? Really good question. <laughs> the, um, I think the answer is the majority of my patients are still pretty, you know, pretty traditionally treated, mm -hmm. which is, you know, therapy and, and medication as appropriate. And, and even ECT shock treatment if it's if they're very unwell, um, but if they're if they're interested and uh, and curious about about psychic phenomena, so I often introduce it now and just see if they're they're up for talking about it and interested. And my first three patients were people who'd had near death experiences. So they'd, in other words, they'd been close to death and floated out of their body and had these marvelous feelings of love and, and peace and joy. Um, and they were curious to, um, to do it. So my first three, pa and Judy is one of those, the one I write about a lot in the book. Um, and they were very up for, for doing a past life regression. Um, and in, in each case, they really got some, some wonderful benefit from it. And, um, and for me, it was like, the, again, it, it, it's when I do it with patients who are really curious, they can't be too, if they're too sick, you know, mm. you've got to sit back. But when they've settled and, and they're interested, um, then, I can, uh, then I can do it with them. And, and often it has quite a, uh, quite a profound effect. It's, again, it gets them seeing the world differently, as, mm. as I do now. You know, so I'm I'm looking at everybody now and thinking that we're all we're all wonderful souls deep down. We're just in this body with this brain for the for the time being. For the time being, and we're here to experience experience this life and uh, mm. and see what happens. But I think deep down, we're all wonderful wonderful spirits or souls, and we're Amazing. all connected in a way that we. Do you fear death, know. John? Uh, not now, no. Not now. I'm not in a hurry to get there, no, um, but I'm, right. I have to say I'm pretty curious about what happens. Um, so I really, my father-in-law had a, uh, he's the closest person I know who had a near-death to have had um, Dacron used to replace his aortic arch back in 1969. Mm -hmm. And on the operating table, he floated out of his body and he could look back down on it, he could see the surgeons, see the, and he said it was so peaceful, so wonderful. He said, and to use his words, there was a feeling of no judgment. That's beautiful. Um, and he never had a fear of death after that. No. So um, now I haven't had one of those experiences, um, but I think with all the reading I've done and and what I've seen through my patients, and um, I think we're fine. We, John, we where, move on. where can people buy the book? Look, the 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 book is is um, available. Um, in on all the online services so amazon book depository booktopia um if you wanted to get it before christmas you'd probably have to go to the um uh, the theosophical bookshop in okay. town i know they've they've, they've got, got it yeah, so, yeah. so and they're terrific they've got a whole range of these these wonderful books that that people look at so amazing yeah. and you've done a few uh, have, you, have you hit the uh, the speaking circuit uh, i haven't done a lot because of COVID. of course it's, it's really restricted things. yeah I've, I've so done, this i've done a couple of um podcasts um, yes the um the consciousness podcast uh, as well as um, Simon Bounds past life podcast um, so and they're good fun they've been good fun amazing today, so we'll have a short break and we might find out um, the plans for the great man for the next uh, few years uh, back very shortly tough times never last Welcome back to the show, I'm Michael Kozilny. Uh, what a great book, The Red Chair. We've got um, the great man, Dr. John Weber, talking about his career of helping others as a psychiatrist, but also um, talking about um, past lives and maybe healing people in that respect. Can you simplify that to me? It sort of makes sense um, because 
people get intuition about maybe we've been here before. Yeah, I think I think to be truthful, if if people do think about it, they've often um, they often have a few psychic experiences, which are you know I had the other. I often now I'll think about a patient I haven't seen for um, for um, for years, mm. and then within the week I'll get rung up by that patient saying, "Can I come back and see you?" Um, so I think we all to some extent have psychic phenomena which we tend to ignore or um, say it's just coincidence. Um, but the past life stuff is is really interesting. With hypnosis, hypnosis is really just um, focus concentration. So it's the ability to to focus on something for long enough that you switch off the rest of your brain. And in doing that, it's it's like switching off the rest of the brain. You then tap in to a, a sort of a, a, a psychic state or a, a state where you can then tap into old memories. Um, I think mediums do that naturally. They're they're tapping into uh, another another realm mm. to um, you know. What's an example of if someone who's um, who's come to you and uh... the look? Uh, an example would be um, now. This wasn't a patient, but I always like telling the story. Um, he he came to me and he said, "Look, I'm just really interested in doing this." And so I I did a couple of past life experiences with him, and he went back into these extraordinary lives. Uh, one of them was Buddhist, where he was. Uh, a Buddhist monk and he became the, the leader of, of the group he was with and had a temple and then the temple got overrun by an enemy group and it was burnt down and he went to the he went to a stage where he was dying um, and dying from smoke inhalation so there was a fire and, and he and he died and da 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 now I didn't see this guy. I mean, he was fine. He was a bit, afterwards he went, whoa, that was a bit full on. So it's like, whoa. And we had a talk about it, but he was fascinated. Um, but um, a year later, I caught up with him and, uh, and he said, John, you know that I've had asthma all my life. And ever since we did that regression, my asthma has resolved. Um, so you go, hmm, okay. Is it possible that we take with us some of our fears or some of our physical issues related to to our past lives? Um, so that kind of thing is 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 quite spectacular. Um, mm. And I've had another one where she's always had wrist pain. She could never explain it. The doctors couldn't explain it, and she went back into a life where she was a a woodworker and ended up losing and dying from a, an accident that chopped mm. off her hand um, and it's you know and after that the pain disappeared um, so you go how does that work I don't know but there's 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 something there I love the way you think outside the square and some of your colleagues you you talk to them about it what's um yeah look my yeah. colleagues have you know I've been surprised I, I mm. um, you know I've, I've got some of them are really open to it and really curious mm. and and others it's a bit like no they remain blinkered and and don't want to don't want to talk about it and they want they're attached to their science mm. but I, I think that this is really important I think and it's really the reason why I wrote the book um, one I do think past life regressions can be very helpful and I haven't um, I'll talk more about that but in, in the end it's um, it's we're a bit arrogant with our science you know it's like well if we can't explain it then it doesn't exist and and that's you know as good scientists good science would be that if you can't if they can't explain it doesn't mean it doesn't exist we just can't explain it in current terms but so we've we've got an arrogance about it, the way we look at things and if you look at um, near-death experiences and particularly what are called the veridical ones where people see things they cannot possibly have seen in that unconscious state uh, and the evidence of mediums and psychic phenomenon and telepathy and telekinesis and then the evidence regarding reincarnation and children particularly talking about having their lives verified um, you've got to sit back and you go okay it's, it just isn't that simple. The fact that we can't explain it at a science level doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, um, so that's, that's really the reason I wrote the book and I, I think it's Amazing. really important. And look, I think the main thing that when I do the regressions is that it's, for a lot of the patients, it just gives them an experience, particularly sometimes they go through the life and then they die mm -hmm. and then they go into that spirit realm. It's like they, exactly like the people with near-death experiences. And they describe this love and this connection and telepathy with others that have died and connection. And, and I think that is often the thing that has the most profound effect on them. They just, they go, wow, okay, there's more to me. There is life after death. 
and that is something quite beautiful. And people with near-death experiences often describe the same thing. That can be quite transformative. So, mm. um, and John, tell me about meditation. Meditation, I think, is a wonderful thing. There's, um, uh, who was it, um, Gabrielle Bernstein said the other day, she, she, uh, and she's lovely spiritual, and she said, um, everyone should meditate for at least 20 minutes a day. And she said, if you're too busy to, med to do that, then you should meditate for an hour. Every day. Yes, and she, she's and quite an inter interesting um, <laughs> author, isn't she? She talks yeah. about uh, leaving it all up to the universe, and um, yeah, and, and it's really and important to uh, to surrender and go with the flow go with at the, flow. the moment, isn't it? John? Exactly, and no, I think that's really important. And you know that whole idea: this too will pass. You this know, too shall time. pass. Yeah, um, and and what's your advice for um, people going through two thousand twenty two with all this uncertainty about business and? personal life and different views. Um, I think I think we're here to experience. I think we're here to, I like the idea of karma, but not as a punishment, more as an idea where we're having a life where we wanted to experience certain things. And if you can sit back and go, okay, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity to, to experience different things, some of it good, some of it bad. Um, but here's the opportunity and to, as you said, find the gratitude with the things that, 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 are, that are good, that are lovely, and see if you can ride the, the road bumps. I mean, when I, my main patient in the book is Judy, um, and she said, her guide said to her, you've got to let go and trust. Wow, thank you very much, sir. Great pleasure. And viewers, thank you very much. Tough times never last. What a great man. We'll see you next week. All the best.